A few years ago, we did a documentary of St. Louis's Jewish community from frontier days to modern times. And from that, Jim Kircher brings you tonight's story with a seasonal twist. You could call this story about the holiday season in St. Louis a Judeo-Christian story, but it's really just an American story. Seeing the lights at Tillis Park is a Christmas tradition taking place on land that was donated by a successful Jewish businessman named Cap Tillis, who had started out with a downtown cigar store. A lot of Jewish family names are now just place names. Steinberg Rink, Allo Plaza, Greensfelder Park. And back when just about everybody did their Christmas shopping downtown, it was the big department stores founded in the 1800s by Jewish immigrants that helped set the holiday mood and create the memories with decorations, elaborate windows, and a chance to sit on Santa's lap. How all that came about is really a story about America itself, with its roots in Europe and the Old West. Aaron Fuller was one of those Jewish American success stories. He was one of the founders of the Sticks Baron Fuller Company and the Grand Leader Department Store. By the 1920s, he was a very, very wealthy man. But he and his partners did not start out with all of this, did not start out with mansions or a store that covered a city block. This was the much more humble start of the Sticks Bear and Fuller story. Two brothers, Julius and Sigmund Baer, had arrived from Germany young and alone, but with the name of a relative and a place to go, Fort Smith, Arkansas. The relative lent them money to open this small store in a nearby town on the Arkansas River. Fort Smith at that time was the last outpost before Oklahoma. Fort Smith was an army garrison, and they handled goods and wagons and tools for people who were homesteading in Oklahoma and North Texas and all that stuff. They prospered. They worked hard. Those guys really worked hard. They slept on the counters at night a lot of times. So the store could be open first thing in the morning for some guy that had to come in and get out. And they wanted to be of service. Aaron Fuller came to America when he was just 14. He worked in Chicago for a while, and then he too headed for Arkansas and went into business with Julius and Sigmund Bear. They bought a store on Fort Smith's main street and called it the Boston Store. It grew bigger along with the town, and they opened branches. And the partners became relatives when Aaron Fuller married Julius and Sigmund's sister, Frida. They often married the sisters or, or cousins of, uh, of, their, of their business partners. And that's how business connections got established. And uh, the, the, Jewish, the early Jewish economy in America was much re reliant on, on uh, family ties and on more general Jewish connections. Towns like Fort Smith were not really isolated outposts. There were ties to bigger cities, the manufacturing, distribution, and banking centers. And for much of the South and the West, that center was St. Louis. And it was the kind of place that drew ambitious men. This, the late 1800s and early 1900s, was the age of the hustling and bustling downtown. Streetcars, elevators, electricity, it all made this the center of everything business, entertainment, and shopping. And this was the age of the giant department store. Everything under one roof. The Bear Brothers and Aaron Fuller opened with their new partner, Charles Stix, the Grand Leader Department Store, which kept moving to bigger and bigger buildings. They grew fast. They really did. And their main competition was the bar company, famous bar. The story of Famous Bar and the May Company also began far from St. Louis. High up in the Rocky Mountains was the silver mining boom town of Leadville, Colorado. David May, who had come from Germany as a child, arrived in Leadville in 1877 
and opened a store with Moses Schoenberg and married his sister. Even here, there was a Jewish community and a synagogue. They went to Denver to open their first department store and then went to St. Louis, where they bought two businesses and combined the famous store with Barr's Dry Goods. St. Louis would become the headquarters of the May Company. They were at the right place at the right time. And department stores um, was also something that was built up by, by Jews in Europe to a great degree. Um, so again, we have this parallel of, of Jewish economic patterns in Europe and in America. Only in America, they were much freer to, to develop and um, to show initiative and be rewarded for it. In the 20th century, more businesses founded by Jewish families would come to St. Louis because it was a national center of the garment industry and shoe manufacturing. The five Edison brothers, who had a shoe store in Atlanta, came to St. Louis in the 1920s and built a company that would become one of the country's largest retailers of women's shoes. But they too were sons of a Jewish immigrant who had started out as a peddler. When the men of that generation, like Aaron Fuller, passed away, they were not just giants in the business world, but in civic life, charitable work, and in the Jewish community. Their deaths made headlines in the city papers, the German papers, and the Jewish papers. Their children and grandchildren often continued their work in the community, and even after their names were gone from the stores and businesses, the contributions remained. When you come to the St. Louis Art Museum, or maybe any encyclopedic museum across the country, many people want to find Van where are the Van Goghs, where are the Monets, where are the Cezans, where are the Gauguins. And this is the room here where you experience that. And what's remarkable is that largely every picture in this room is from the Steinberg family or from the Schomburg. The family names are all over the museum on labels next to paintings they or their foundations gave to the St. Louis Art Museum. But no one had as great an impact here as Morton May, head of the May Company and grandson of its founder. Morton May, who died in 1983, gave some 5,000 works of art to the museum, oceanic art, Mesoamerican art, and his early appreciation of Max Beckmann became the core of the museum's fine collection of German Expressionist paintings. We owe a real, a real sense of gratitude, not only to those families and what they, what they sort of did in the, in the, uh, the mid-20th century in building these collections, but that they saw that they would come to the St. Louis Art Museum and be the core of this great city's art museum um, that would bring us international attention. Morton May was a more prominent and public figure than Cap Tillis, who didn't really like the spotlight. When he donated his estate, he couldn't have guessed that Tillis Park would become the home of the winter wonderland, but he probably would have approved. Tillis was Jewish, but when it came to giving, he did not focus on a single religion, just the opposite. When he established a charitable fund in the 1920s, it was called non-sectarian, and stipulated that a rabbi and St. Louis's archbishop should serve together on its board. The fund still exists, along with its interfaith philosophy. Like the park, it is truly, as they say, one of those gifts that really does keep on giving. <laughs>